We serve a wonderful Father, don't we? Is that better? Frank was a bit taller. Well, it was uh, it was a real blessing to have some extended time this afternoon to uh, share and delve into some interesting topics and uh, get better acquainted with uh, with the brothers and sisters. Uh, I'm just. Uh, wondering if we could pray. I, this is a subject that uh, we're moving into the second angel's message and I, I feel my need. I'm wondering, Brother Len, would you like to pray? And Brother Dennis, could you just pray for us if we can kneel together and uh, we'll begin. We humbly come before thee in adoration and praise to lift you up. We pray for your spirit to be here, to be among us, for you have promised that where two or three are gathered together, your spirit is here also. Amen. And we thank you for Jesus, our Redeemer. As the message is given tonight, we pray that you will bless Adrian, mm. that he may speak the truth from thy word. Amen. That he may the Spirit may speak through him, if not be his words, but your words coming to our hearts afresh. Let it be a pouring out of further study and of knowledge of thee, Father, the only true God. Mm -hmm. We thank you for this opportunity to be here, and I pray a blessing upon all who are here that can hear this message today. And I pray for those, Father, that are on their way here. Please watch over and protect them. Amen. Give them a blessing as they drive so they can come and enjoy and partake of thy spirit. We pray and we thank thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brothers. <laughs> you got there. Four knees. <laughs> Got that right. Well, last night we were looking at the, the first of three presentations on the third angel's message. And uh, you will remember that I introduced the topic with the parable of the talents. And we focused on the third uh, man... Let's go back there to Matthew 25. Just to refresh. And this man relates some information to the landowner or the one who is giving the talents. And it says in uh, Matthew 25, verse 24, Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man. And I related that in relationship to the natural man's response to the word of God. Man creates a perception of what he is hearing in the word of God and it comes out in these words, I knew thee that thou art a hard man. And as a young person in relationship to the three angels' messages, as I mentioned to you, the first angel's message was, get your act together. The judgment is on. Angel number two, the other churches are already out of the game. They're out. You right, Jason? You hearing crackling? Okay, <laughs> we'll keep going, see what happens. And the third angel's message is, if you don't get your act together, you're going to burn in a very hot place for an indiscriminate amount of time. I knew thee that thou art a hard man. 
as we approach the, the three angels' messages, uh, it's a growing experience. And what I was attempting to show last night was that the fear, the fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come is actually a very intimate, relational question about the desire to dwell in the presence of Jesus and follow the Lamb where, wherever he goes. It's a, it's a marriage question. And yet when we hear, when we read this on the surface without, without the deeper understanding, it sounds very harsh and it sounds threatening. You think of the story of when the Son of God came to Adam and Eve and he was saying, Adam, where are you? A voice of love. And yet when Adam hears that voice, in his mind it's, Adam, where are you? And he goes and hides. He's hearing something different from actually what is going on. The perception of who God is has changed. And I, I want to now bring this into the, the second angel's message. The second angel's message, and I, I have usually entitled this wrestling with the second angel. Because I have, I have wrestled over how to understand this passage of scripture and how it affects the way I, I look at things. A little bit more personal history. We want to talk about vulnerability in a safe place. I mentioned to you last night that uh, the first, my first real encounter with the three angels' messages was that in my final year of high school, I, I had to memorize the three angels' messages for an exam. So that exam, the pain of losing an exam, I understood pain, so I memorized them. And uh, as, I, as you're memorizing and going over it, the words start to uh, penetrate in your mind. Anyway, in the providence of God, it, it, not long after that, uh, my class was uh, taken on a, on a trip to visit Avondale College, which is... Uh, a, a very smaller version of Andrews University but in Australia. It's the only institution that we, we have there. And uh, we were, as final year high school students, we were taken there to awaken our interest in studying at Avondale College. And uh, I remember the the night, all of us, many of us uh, young men were just, uh, in, there was like one room and there was just, we we're all on the floor, bunked down and the, you know, the lights go out and then someone throws something and then someone bump nudges someone and next thing we're full on, having a full on fight and, and, uh, Next thing, the language is flying, all the four-letter words are going around all over the place and someone's head gets banged into the wall and, and it's getting really serious. And in the middle of all that, with stuff flying around all around me and punches being thrown, this voice in my head says, and this is the next generation to take the third angel's message to the world. And immediately after that, the door where I was staying opened and I could see across to the hall where the, the young ladies were staying. And I saw two young ladies sitting on the steps. And I was just compelled to walk towards them. And so I'm, I'm walking through amidst of projectiles and fists and... And I wasn't even looking. I don't even know how I got through other than my angel was protecting me. I was drawn. And I went over to these two young ladies 
And they were sitting there and they were studying the Sabbath school lesson. I'm going, whoa, religious people. I'm in a Seventh-day Adventist high school, trained to be ready to give the gospel to the world. And I had been feeding on Hollywood and all the movies, and I was enjoying just playing games and sports and all of these kinds of things. I didn't really, at the age of 17 years of age, I, I, I just wasn't interested in spiritual things, really. Uh, there's more to that story later, but th this is where I was in my current experience. And these two young ladies are, are studying the Sabbath school lesson, and something compelled me to stay there and listen. And... I just listened to them talk and they were just talking about passages in the Bible and just, just the fact that these two young ladies were sitting there openly sharing about the Bible, it really, it really, really spoke to me. And God was working on my heart. One of those young ladies now lives in North Carolina, over near Raleigh. And uh, I'm really, really indebted to her for that simple little witness that she played in, in my life at, at, at that particular time. So, uh, and an in interesting encounter, a calling. I was being called to understand the third angel's message. That event had a, an impact on my life. And having, if I hadn't have memorized the three angels' messages, that phrase, and this is the next generation to take the third angel's message as well, wouldn't have, wouldn't have meant anything to me. But having memorized it and knowing something about the Adventist church and seeing all the, 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 the just frivolity and stupidity of youth uh, that I was involved in, I, I, f I, I felt the judgment. But I felt it in a way that I was drawn out. And so, not long after that, uh, I, I began to read the book Steps to Christ, and I came across, across page 13 of that little book, and it said, Behold him in the wilderness, or oh, behold him in Gethsemane, behold him upon Calvary, and I was just trying to do what the word says, to behold him in Gethsemane. And I was thinking about Jesus and how he sweat drops of blood. And uh, then, it, then it talked about the separation between the Father and the Son and how Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And there was a, a, something communicated to me that there was a cost. The beginning of my journey was an exposure to the gift of the Father of His Son. That's what began my journey. What attracted me to God was this love gift of the Father in giving His Son. I remember when it says, Behold Him upon the cross, and I, I cannot explain to you, but there was a vivid picture in my mind of Jesus upon the cross and he turned and he looked at me without one piece or anything on his face that showed any level of condemnation towards me, though I knew I was a sinner. And it was so real in my mind that I... I just began to weep because I saw acceptance in that face. Acceptance. Maybe a bit like Peter, knowing that I was, I was a hypocrite and uh, a volatile person. Um, Craig was telling some of his experiences this morning. Uh, I don't want to glorify... Uh, 
the past, but just so you understand, I was very much into sports and um, when I would play tennis and when uh, I couldn't hit the ball over the net properly, um, the racket usually ended up in a very peculiar shape with a lot of loud expressions uh, coming out of my mouth and sometimes the racket would end up 50 feet away and uh, people would have to get out of my way and um, I, had a, I had a temper issue and uh, so the, you know and I wasn't proud of that and uh, but in looking in the face of Jesus I just felt this acceptance and I, I can't explain to you what actually was happening there other than the spirit of Jesus was was reaching out to me and so just as I, I, I was just there and I was just crying and I'm 17 years of age and I don't know much about the Bible and I, I well I did but I did, it not, not much had penetrated and I just said Lord I don't really understand what this means but I, I really want you to come into my life because I, I've, I, I screw everything up, and I say all the wrong things, and I want to be a better person, and I, and please come into my life. And I felt a peace and a joy come into my soul that I'd never experienced before. It was just such a clean feeling, such a peaceful feeling. And that feeling stayed with me for at least six weeks. Just tremendous. And uh, then I began to study. I, I had a thirst. I, I began... It's like before, you know, read, listening to passages of the Bible and then I went to a Bible study and we looked at two or three verses in the book of Philippians and, my, and all this stuff was jumping out at me and... And I'm like, whoa, this, I can't deal with three verses. And there was all this stuff that I was learning just out of three verses in Philippians chapter 2. And, uh, and the Spirit of God was teaching me. And I began to just, uh, up until the, that time, I had done everything I could to get out of reading. I hated reading. And, and now I couldn't stop reading. The things that you once hated you now love and then uh, what was interesting is that just after the, just just before this experience i'd organized a huge gathering of all of my friends and i'd just to make sure that everybody could hear what was going on i hired a sound system to make sure that we could vibrate the house and uh and all my friends came around and then I, before, before the event, I had this experience and then all my friends came around and all the music is going and all the videos are playing and I'm walking around going, what am I doing here? And, and I'm listening to my friends and they're talking about such frivolous things, immoral things, empty things. And suddenly I got scared because I'm going, hang on, I used to do this and I really enjoyed this and now I don't enjoy it anymore. And I, I can't really explain this to you, but this thought came into my head, well, Adrian, this is your definition of fun and all of your fun has just evaporated. So now you're a Christian, you're not going to have any more fun. And I ran out onto the front lawn and I put my fist up and I said, you've wrecked my life. <laughs> no lightning, still acceptance. It was, so, it was such a transformation in, in my life that it took me by surprise in terms of the transformation in, in, in my life. And I thank the Lord Jesus that he forgave me for that little outburst. I... 
still had some things to work on in my experience. But then I began to read and I began to learn about the book of Revelation and the Adventist uh, understanding of prophecy and the gospel and the sanctuary. And I began to study more about these three angels' messages. And then I came across this quote. At that stage, it probably was in the book of Evangelism. Not one of my favourite books these days. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given a work of most, of most solemn import. The proclamation of the first, second and third angel's messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Like I'm going, okay, right on. I need to study this. I need to understand. And uh, I began to read, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. So I studied all about the 2,300 days in 1844, the hour of his judgment, worship him that made heaven and earth, the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, being sealed with the Father's name in the forehead. I began to study uh, all of these things. And... I could see uh, the beauty of that message. When I came to the second angel's message, it said, and there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And from my study and my reading, this was the fallen churches and it was a proclamation concerning those fallen churches and that I as a Seventh-day Adventist was called to make this proclamation about the fallen churches. As I, as I began to engage this and, and that of course involved exposing the falsehoods of Sunday observance and the coming of the mark of the beast and the, the falsehoods of the immortality of the soul and all of these kinds of doctrines, that this was part of my duty to expose Babylon, expose the false works of darkness. And I would listen to some uh, of the evangelists who would preach on some of these subjects and they would speak with such power and such conviction about the need to come out of Babylon. Some of the difficulty that I began to feel was like, the, and it, it took a while for this to come to my head, it's sort of like, the second angel's message was kind of like saying, the Adventist is saying, when he says Babylon has fallen, because of where he's standing, he's saying, Essentially, this is the message. I'm right, you're wrong. And I began to struggle with that. How is it? Is this how we give this message? I'm right, you're wrong. When I, when I listen to a lot of the speakers, just, just trying to vibe the way the message is coming across, that's the way it sounded to me. I'm right. You're wrong. And how, how does that work? These were some of the thoughts that were going through my mind. Then I came across a quote, Review and Herald, April 1, 1890. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. The third angel's message, of course, is the culmination of the first and the second and the third angel's messages. So when we say another angel followed them, another angel followed, that's when you get to the third, it's a, it's a repeating of the first two and then including of the third. So when she says the third angel's message is justification by faith in verity. As a young man, justification by faith in verity had something to do with the gospel. 
And she says it is the third, it is the third angel's message in verity. And I was going, okay, gospel, gospel in the three angels' messages. I saw, not, saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. Okay, I can see gospel in angel number one. Angel number two. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Where's the gospel? In the second angel's message. Is there a gospel in the second angel's message? It's an, in, it's an invitation to come into the gospel. Okay, I could, I could see that. Um, maybe it's, it's connected with the first angel's message, so it's part of a package. Fear God, give glory to him. Come to the, to the water, come and receive the gospel. That's, that's something that's interesting. Uh, then I noticed something interesting. And this really puzzled me. It, it got me thinking. When, when we see the first angel, verse 7, what kind of voice does the first angel speak with? Saying with a loud voice. When we see the second angel, what kind of voice? There's no loud voice. And then we get to a, the third angel's message. Loud voice. Is, 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 is this indicating intensity? There's a loud voice, then there's not a loud voice, then there's a, a loud voice. And what's really interesting is when you come over to Revelation chapter 18, verse 2, the fourth angel, he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying... Babylon is fallen. Do you, do you think it's possible in the historical context of the, the giving of the, the third angel's message that the, the intensity of the voice relates to the depth of understanding of what that message is actually saying? Would that make sense? That the second angel's message, when it was first given, it was not fully understood it was given but not fully understood but something occurs amongst God's people so that when it comes to Revelation 18 it clicks and what's really interesting is that the earth is lightened with this the glory of this message specifically that Babylon is fallen is fallen and this is where I come to my dilemma. Here I am understanding, in some ways, I'm right, you're wrong. And that's going to lighten the earth with its glory. Does that make sense? There's something not right. Can you see I'm wrestling with this angel going, what is going on here? What, what is this? This repeating, a repeating of the second angel's message that lightens the earth with its glory. When I went to seminary, there were, I could see that there were other men that were struggling with this same question. During the periods of the 1940s and 50s, we'd had these evangelists who had preached the third angel's message very powerfully. They were men that commanded respect. Uh, they usually had an entourage that was with them that would help them run their meetings, and they were very powerful men that walked the sawdust trail of the tent meetings. And they would speak with great conviction. Another generation of men, maybe cut in a different mould, began to question this I'm right, you're wrong motif. I use that word. This theme that's it's not really spoken, but it's coming out in this mode. By the way that the, the scriptures are revealed, it's I'm here to talk 
and you're here to listen. That's, that's the way it, it, it seemed to come across. And so I came across uh, uh, some writing, and, and I'm going back to the, the person of uh, Desmond Ford, and one day his son asked him, what is wrong with Adventists believing themselves especially chosen by God? Because this has to do with the issue of the remnant, what it means to be part of the remnant as opposed to being part of Babylon. And, and Desmond Ford's son asked him, what's wrong with Adventists believing themselves specially chosen by God? And his father responds, it makes them proud. And pride is the antithesis of complete reliance on Christ for salvation. But without pride, without such pride, groups go out of business. And as I studied the history of the, the church, I, there was... There was something in what he was saying that, that I could see was true. This, this pride, rich and increased with goods, and that we, we are right and you are wrong and you will, will listen to us. But this conclusion that the only way to resolve this issue of pride is to remove the label of being part of the remnant of God and remove the label that says that the fallen church is a Babylon. That's a fairly drastic way of dealing with that question. And we, we come back to that central point of how does a man give a message, Babylon is fallen, without coming across as though he's saying, well, I'm right and you're wrong and uh, getting value out of giving that message to sinners who need to repent. And so I began to uh, think about, about Babylon. What, what is Babylon about? What are the spiritual principles that are related to Babylon? And how do we, how do we relate to these? Have a look at uh, Daniel chapter 4. Verse 30, thinking about the principles, the spirit of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of my kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? One of the, one of the, keynote aspects of Babylon is a sense of satisfaction in things achieved. That's what he's saying. Is not this great Babylon which I have built? I have built. And if we look at Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 19... Isaiah 13 and verse 19. It says, And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellence, excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Beauty. A beautiful a focus on display and outward, the hanging gardens of Babylon, projection, display. And then I was just over a bit further, Isaiah 14, 4 to 6, that they'll take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and of the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke. There's that word continual. <laughs> a continual stroke. He that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. One of the key principles of Babylon is oppression. Satisfaction in achievement, performance, and oppression of others. 
And when I began to think about the spirit of Babylon, I began to think about some of these things seem strangely familiar in my experience within the remnant church. Have I encountered a spirit of satisfaction in, in the things that have been achieved? We, we, you read the church papers, uh, uh, we, are, we are doing this here and we are building this building here and we are flying people over here and we are building this institution here and we are doing this here and we are doing the work of the Lord. Is not this great church, community that I have built? We've, we've built up our mailing list, we've got a website going and we're doing all these things, telling people what we're could that fall into that category? Is it possible to get satisfaction out of working for the Lord? I certainly had encountered that and experienced that. And what about being in a group of people? Have you ever been in a group of people where one, two, three or, or more really have a point that they want to make sure that everybody else in the group comes to that understanding and they don't let it go until you either submit or leave. <laughs> a desire to rule. A desire to rule that sometimes is very overt, sometimes it's very, very... What's the word? Some people rule through the second guess. You know what I mean? It's like, well, no, no, we don't have any leaders here. And, and then someone says, uh, uh, well, let's, let's do this. Well, I'm not so sure about that. I, I I'm not, don't think that's a good idea. And then someone comes up with an idea and someone says, well, I'm not so sure about that. And uh, no, I don't think that's a good idea. The second guess. Someone who rules covertly through the second guess and undermining and playing it down and you know what I'm saying? There's, uh, th there's different ways to rule or to get your point across and uh, having been in many groups I've, I've been exposed to, to many of them, I'm sure you have as well. So, you know, as I thought about the, the principles of Babylon and of course <laughs> the in the context of oppression, enforcing a Sunday law on the whole world is really that. Well, that's a that's a very old, that's the ultimate expression of oppression, isn't it? You will worship the way we tell you to worship, or else. And so I, I began to ask myself the question: Well, if if I'm seeing what the Bible is telling me about Babylon. The spirit of Babylon, about satisfaction and achievement, about uh, oppression and display. Have you ever been into churches where you suddenly sense there's an emphasis on display? I've been there. Been there myself. So, if I see this going on amongst... Uh, the group of believers that I'm with who claim to be the remnant, uh, what's the difference between what I'm experiencing and what's happening in Babylon? What's, what's the difference? Can I claim to be better than the people of Babylon if I'm doing the deeds of the people in Babylon? And let me put it this way. We, we know that Babylon is a prostitute. So what is worse in the eyes of God? To be the prostitute or to be one of the remnant who sleeps with the prostitute? Who's, who's, who has the greatest sin? Who, who receives the greater condemnation? Babylon or Laodicea? Laodicea. And as I thought about these things, 
I, I began to think about the whole question of proximity. You know, I, I want to draw this. Uh, if we say that that this is Bab Babylon, and I'm standing here, and I'm going to give this, the second angel's message, Babylon is fallen. Now, in terms of the spirit of Babylon, the spirit of oppression, the spirit of control, satisfaction and achievement, I'm not talking primarily doctrine in this case. I'm talking about the spirit that you're partaking of. If you're in the spirit of Babylon and you're standing here and then you hear the words, Babylon is fallen, what's just happened? If Babylon falls, what's happened to you? You're free. Ah, that's starting to sound like righteousness by faith, isn't it? Freedom. It's all about proximity, where you think you are. I thank you, God, I am not like other men. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Your perception of your identity affects the way you relate to the second angel's message as to how you, you're going to give that message. What's really interesting is that when you read the context of that word, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It actually comes from the book of Jeremiah. I want you to look at the context of this. Jeremiah, chapter 50. The phrase Babylon is fallen, is fallen comes in Jeremiah 51, verse 8. But at the end of Jeremiah, chapter 50, verses 33 and 34. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the children of Israel and, their children, and the children of Judah were oppressed together, and all that took them captive held them fast. They refused to let them go. And earlier you can see about the Chaldeans. It's talking about the Chal Chaldeans. And it's talking about Babylon oppressing the children of Israel and holding them Fast. Verse 34, the Redeemer is strong, the Lord of hosts is his name. He shall thoroughly plead their cause that he may give rest to the land and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. This is sounding like gospel, isn't it? To give rest to the land, freedom. It, so in the context of... The original context of Babylon is fallen. It's in the context that God's people have been taken captive by Babylon. So by the time we come to Jeremiah 51 verse 8, Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. How for her, take balm for, for her pain, if so be she may be healed. So when the second angel's message is originally given in the Laodicean mindset rich and increased with goods obviously preaching against the, the teachings of Babylon the immortality of the soul uh, Sunday sacredness the Trinity uh, amongst other doctrines there is a cry that goes out against Babylon but it doesn't go out with a loud voice. But in Revelation 18, God's people find themselves in their true condition. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the cry goes out, not primarily as a cry of condemnation, but a cry of freedom. Babylon is 
fallen in my life. The power of oppression, my desire to rule and control other people is gone. My need to perform and achieve and prove to you that I am valuable by what I do has disappeared. Through the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone, I am free. The second angel's message is justification by faith in verity, just as the prophet said it is. It's a beautiful message. Cry freedom. I began to think about the fact that I think I've got a quote here. The second angel's message is still a message of condemnation. But it it is primarily a message of freedom. Let me read you something. The fallen denominational churches are Babylon. Babylon has been fostering poisonous doctrines, the wine of error. This wine of error is made up of the false doctrines such as the natural immortality of the soul, the eternal torment of the wicked, the denial of the pre-existence of Christ prior to his birth in Bethlehem, and advocating and exalting the first day of the week above God's holy sanctified day. These and kindred errors are presented by, to the world by the various churches. So I began to think... Where do we find in the scripture a cry of freedom that also condemns? And you know where I found the answer? We come back to Mary Magdalene. A cry of freedom that causes condemnation. And when Jesus was in, in Matthew 26, I just, I'll read through this. And when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? Are these the words of condemned men? Possibly. Maybe they feel it. For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Who instigated this little charge? Judas. Judas. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said unto them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor always with you, but me you do not have always for in pouring this fragrant oil on my body she did it for my burial assuredly i say to you wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial for her you remember the quote we read the other night about mary magdalene now the act of mary was in such marked contrast to judas's selfishness that he was put to shame a woman that pours out the alabaster box, she's crying tears of joy because she is free. Hallelujah. And in expressing her freedom, she condemned the son of perdition. Was it her intention to condemn Babylon? That wasn't her focus. Her focus was on the joy and the freedom that she had found in the only begotten Son of God. And in that expression of freedom, Babylon was condemned. Is that beautiful? Can you see the gospel in the second angel? Can you see why the second angel's message will lighten the earth with its glory, crying with a strong voice, the cry is not primarily the cry of condemnation. It is the cry of freedom. When God's people fully experience the righteousness of Christ, that nothing they do of themselves 
inspiration. If you were to take all that is good and noble and lovely and holy and just in man and to offer it to God as having a part in the plan of salvation, it would be rejected as treason. Man has no merit in himself. Christ alone. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And when God's people come to that point, they will cry freedom and Babylon will fall. And once again, Mary Magdalene leads the way. She shows us the way. She shows us the way to bring about final events. We want to study the final events of Earth's history. We study Mary Magdalene. Because the fourth angel is a cry of freedom. I have been set free. I have the mind of Christ. All the promises of God are yes in him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you so much for the, the second angel's message. Beautiful message. Precious, precious message. A message of freedom. Freedom from the works of the law. Freedom from self-justification. Freedom from proving myself to other men and women. Freedom to walk in all the statutes and commandments of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would open our eyes to see that we are not standing outside of Babylon pointing at them. We are not better than other men. We are have the mind we are all of one mankind we are just as in need as any other being but you came to set the captives free and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord and I thank you for hearing this prayer in Jesus name Amen